Why even a ministry like Answers in Genesis? Why open a creation museum? Why build an ark? Well, I mentioned in the presentation I gave yesterday that we published a book back in 2009 called Already Gone, where we had America's research group research why two-thirds of young people have already left the church in America and very few are returning. And over in England right now, the statistics indicate two-thirds of teenagers say they don't even believe in God, by the way. And whereas church attendance in England used to be 50% of the population before the last war, well, now it's down to about 6 or 7%. We see Europe has become very, very pagan and certainly less Christianized than it was in the past. But the same is true of Canada, Australia, our whole Western world. But here in America, we're losing the coming generations from the church. There's no doubt about it. And we did the research on that and found that the millennials, the 20s generation that have already left the church, they didn't get answers to the skeptical questions of the age, what they were taught at school about evolution and millions of years and so on caused them to have doubts that you can trust the Bible, had all these questions. Most churches just teach Bible stories. You know what I mean by Bible stories? Jonah and the, and the great fish, the feeding of the 5,000s, Paul's missionary journey, Jesus on the cross, Noah in the ark and so on. And so most of our churches teach Bible stories. By the way, the word story today, what does it mean to the millennials today? What does the word story mean today? fairy tale and you know we shouldn't even be using that word anymore because it's changed meaning and yet we tell kids in our Sunday schools let's have a bible story let's have a story about the ark I'm actually challenging people let's not use the word story because it's sort of changed meaning in our culture today you know even the word God has changed meaning you know generations ago when you went to the public schools in America and you said God most people would think of the God of the Bible you go today and say God and they say which God there are many gods See, even, even the word God has changed meaning in people's eyes. And so when we did the research, we found that these people had questions about, well, you know, what about the Garden of Eden? Was it real? How could Noah fit the animals on the ark? And how, is there any evidence for a global flood? And how can there be a loving God with all this death and suffering in the world? You know what we're finding? M most churches, most Christian colleges, Bible colleges, seminaries, haven't taught how to defend the faith against those questions of today. But we go out there and we tell people, trust in Jesus. Uh, believe that he died on the cross and was raised from the dead. Actually, what's really happened is this. In many ways, the world has indoctrinated generations of kids in the church not to believe that you can trust the Bible. And much of the church has just gone on preaching the message of the gospel, but not ensuring that coming generations believe the book from which the message comes. And that's been a major problem. We also did research in 2014, published a, a new book in 2015 called Ready to Return on the millennial generation that are still in the church. And I gave some of the results yesterday in the presentation. The 20s generation that regularly attend church right now in America, 40% say they're not born again. 65% say if you're a good person, you'll go to heaven. 40% say gay marriage is okay, and another 10%, that means 50% would not speak against gay marriage, and 20% say there could be other holy books uh, like the Bible, such as the Koran. Uh, in fact, 10% don't even know, so 30% think there could be other holy books uh, inspired like the Bible. And so we see we have a major problem. Not only that, when we did the research in 2015, it was the second time we did this research as to, why, uh, as to what would happen if we built uh, a Noah's Ark and how many people would come. And the research indicated 1.4 to 2.2 million people. We had them ask some questions about the general state of the culture. And this is a general population study. And so one of the questions they asked, the researchers asked was this, if you went to church regularly as kids, do you still attend most Sundays or did you stop attending? Notice with the 60s generation, 22% who used to go to church have stopped attending, but with the 20s generation, it's 53% that have stopped attending. We are losing the coming generations. We're not passing on that spiritual legacy to the coming generations, and we're losing that before our very eyes. In fact, in America, we are on the precipice of catastrophic change right now. It only takes one generation to lose a culture. And when you think about America, I would say America has been the greatest Christianized nation on earth. You can't say Christian nation, but certainly very Christianized. And America, if you think about it, has the largest number of churches and colleges and Christian resources, Christian media. In fact, America right now, I would say, has more Christian resources than it's ever had in its history. And yet, from a worldview perspective, America is becoming less Christian every day. 
The church is not impacting the culture like it used to. In fact, we see moral relativism pervading the culture. You know an apt a description of, of America, in fact, a whole Western world, in the book of Judges, when they had no king, no absolute authority, they all did what was right in their own eyes. See, if there's no absolute authority, if you don't have an absolute basis, then how do you decide what's right and wrong? What, what's good and what's bad? What, what's evil? What's not evil? How do you decide that? It's, it's interesting that, you know, when I have... Uh, for instance, uh, atheists that talk to me sometimes, and they like to use words like, that's evil and that's good and that's bad. How can they use words like that? <laughs> I was answering the question once on radio where Cain got his wife, explaining that we're all related and we all go back to Adam and Eve because people have this idea when you get married, you can't marry your relative. I've got news for you. If you don't marry your relative, you're not marrying a human. Then you've really got a problem, okay? <laughs> and so... Adam and Eve, the Bible says in Genesis 5-4, had sons and daughters. So obviously, originally, brothers married sisters. And in, in biblical context, provided it's one man and one woman, that's no different than a man and woman getting married today because we're all related anyway. But when I, when I said that, this atheist said, with brothers married sisters, that's immoral. First thing I said to him, how can you say it's immoral? You're an atheist. You can't accuse somebody of being immoral. You can't do that. And you see, they, they don't have that basis. But... What we see today is this. We see generations of kids that have been taken through an education system. 85 to 90% of kids from church homes go to the public schools where they throw God out, the Bible out, prayer out, the creation out. They teach that the whole of reality can be explained by natural processes. Do you know what naturalism is? Naturalism is atheism. That's what it is. And they've been taught all this information that contradicts the Bible. You know what we tend to do in our churches? We tell them, trust in Jesus. He died on the cross for your sin. And what's the world been doing? What's the devil been doing? Getting them not to believe the book. And now we wonder why we're losing generations of them. In fact, the more we look at our culture, we see our culture abandoning the Christian worldview in regard to marriage, the abortion issue. We have the transgender issue, even the bathroom issue, that even the Supreme Court. Who, who, who would have thought you'd have to have a Supreme Court start to rule on, on bathrooms and who you can let into to, to bathrooms and so on? I mean, who would, have, who would have thought it would even come to that? And by the way, as I like to remind people, you know, the Bible says God made the male and female from the beginning. So we actually have male and female restrooms here at the museum and the ark. Uh, just so that you know that. But you know, the more that you look at our culture, as I read Genesis 6 about the wickedness in the times of Noah, then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And you know, I, I read that verse and, and, and I realize actually... Our day is not as bad as the days of Noah because there are only eight people that went on board that ark. Can you imagine what it must have been like? No wonder Noah is in Hebrews 11 in that hall of fame that you see there. Can you imagine him building the ark and being a preacher of righteousness and the whole world was against him, against God? except for his family. Can you imagine that? I mean, we think it's bad. You should see all the articles we get written about us, the scoffers and the mockers, and they twist things and they lie, and they lie about the Creation Museum and the Ark and, and about me. And of course, I get blamed for everything because I happen to be the CEO. So even, even when Georgia Purdom speaks or writes an article on our website, I get blamed for it anyway. That's, that's what these secularists do. But you know, I, I, sometimes you, you look at that and, and you say, oh man, all these scoffers and mockers. But that's nothing compared to what it must have been like for Noah. No wonder he's in that Hebrews 11 Hall of Fame. And I think to myself, man, if Noah can be a preacher of righteousness amidst a world of wickedness and, and build an ark, we can do things for the Lord, can't we? We can go out there and preach the word. And so... You know, it's interesting, uh, the, the burden for the museum, the Creation Museum, actually goes back to my days in Australia as a teacher. One of the first lessons I taught in the public schools in Australia, the students put up their hand and said, Sir, we heard you're a Christian. Yes. Well, how can you be a Christian when we know the Bible's not true? Why, is, why do you say the Bible's not true? And they opened up their textbooks, what they taught about evolution in millions of years. And the Lord gave me a real burden then to teach them how to think correctly about science. Which is, which is what I did as I was talking with Bill Nye. Remember the debate with Bill Nye? He was up here on this stage. You can still see his footprints down here somewhere. Uh, this is where he We had another interesting debate recently because he came to the ark and I spent two hours walking him through the ark. It was like an impromptu debate. It was like the second debate all over again. It was interesting. It was a clash of worldviews. But, you know, these students, when they said that to me, I realized that the teaching of evolution in millions of years was a big stumbling block to them being receptive to the 
gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Lord gave me a real burden to reach out to them and teach them about science. And I started speaking on these issues. I would take them to museums and they're all from an evolutionary perspective. And, and the Lord gave me a burden. Why can't we have a creation museum? And you know, I and one of our board members in Australia stood on a piece of property. And this is nearly 40 years ago and prayed for a creation museum. And the Lord answered that prayer in 2007 in Kentucky, in the United States of America. A little different to what I thought would happen, uh, but that's how it happened. My wife and I actually came over in 1987 to America as missionaries to a pagan culture. And America is becoming a pagan culture, the way it's going. And it does need missionaries to call the church and the culture back to the authority of the word of God. So I had this burden to build a creation museum and... You know, I come over speaking in churches in, a, in America in the 80s, and then Dr. Henry Morris, the late Dr. Henry Morris, asked if I would come and work at the Institute for Creation Research to help them get the message uh, out to churches. And uh, so uh, I, I did that, and then instead of returning to Australia, I realized that America was the center of the Christian world, and America was uh, uh, the center of the business world, and if we're going to build a creation museum, America was certainly the place uh, to do it. And uh, so that's why we moved out here uh, to uh, Kentucky. And, and people often say to us, why did you build the Creation Museum uh, out here in Kentucky? Well, we're within a one-day drive of two-thirds of America's population. And within a, 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 a two-hour flight of 80% uh, of the population. And so it's an incredible place to be uh, demographically right out here uh, in Kentucky. And so. What are we having here? Some problems? Yeah, we're not getting your screens popping up. We're not getting my screens popping up. Okay, so what can we do about that? I'm going to check here. Because my settings are fine. I'm not sure. I'm going to double check. Okay, we all have to just wait. <laughs> Sorry. And this is, this is live on Facebook as well, so this is really messing this up. I think it came up that time, didn't it? I'm wondering if it's keynote. There, there it is. we are. Okay. All right. So, you know, computers are evil things. <laughs> you know, when, when, Jesus, when Jesus actually uh, cast the demons into those pigs and then they drowned in, in the sea and then they waited for computers. <laughs> and that's where they reside today. I'm totally convinced of that. So anyway, let's come back here. So we, we built the, the Creation Museum here. We're within a one-day drive of two-thirds of America's population. We're right near Interstate 75, which is the second busiest north-south interstate in America. What an incredible place to be to reach this nation. And it's easy to get from, from other countries in the world uh, as well. And so the Lord led us here. Then in 2004, as we're building the Creation Museum, over the years, many people have asked us, you know, about wouldn't it be great to, to find Noah's Ark or to, to, to see Noah's Ark or what, what about if we, we could even build Noah's Ark? And I remember we even had uh, workshops or programs for churches where you get balloons and fill them with helium and you sort of uh, go out to a, a football field or something and try to peg out uh, how big it was. Of course, Noah's Ark is actually one and a half times the length of a football field. So it's pretty hard to be able to show the size. But in 2004, we're talking about, what are we going to do when the Creation Museum's open? I mean, you know, you can't just stop back and do nothing, right? <laughs> we've, got to do, we've got to impact more people. How do you impact more, millions of people uh, with uh, the message of the gospel? And so I started talking about, what if we build a Noah's Ark, put it on the other side of the lake here at the Creation Museum? In 2005, we actually wrote down our number one priority when we opened the Creation Museum would be to build a Noah's Ark. And so in 2008, we stepped out and actually did research. What would happen if we built a Noah's Ark? How many people would come? And then in 2010, we master planned it. And then in 2016, on July 7, we opened it. <laughs> and so now we have Noah's Ark. We have the Creation Museum. And you know, you know the word I want you to think about? We built them as reminders. Reminders. To remind the world of the truth of God's word. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the passage in the Bible in Joshua about Joshua leading the people of Israel across the Jordan River, a normally fast-flowing river, and leads them across the river as a miracle, a miracle of God. 
And then God told them through Joshua to take up 12 stones. Take for yourselves 12 stones from here out of the midst of Jordan. So why were they told to take 12 stones, one for each of the tribes of Israel? What do these stones mean? And Joshua goes on, that this may be a sign, a reminder, a memorial, a reminder to the children of Israel forever. You see, the 12 stones were there to remind the next generation what God did. They spoke to the children of Israel saying, when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what are these stones? Let your children know. Let your ch- Don't forget to pass on that spiritual legacy to the next generation. Make sure you tell the next generation. Make sure you pass on what God has done. Make sure you, you go to the next generation and, and you tell them. You see, people, Malachi 2, one of the primary importances of marriage. Why did God make two one, which is a reference back to Genesis, that woman came from man that were one flesh. And, and again, another reference, it's man and woman, because the woman is of the man. Paul even says that in 1 Corinthians 11. But the primary importance of marriage, to produce not just offspring, what sort of offspring? Godly offspring. We're to produce godly offspring who influence the world for Jesus Christ. To produce godly offspring who influence the world for Jesus Christ. To produce godly offspring who influence the world for Jesus Christ. But that's not happening. We're losing the coming generations. And you know what happened here? What a lesson for us. You know what happened here? Because we find out that they didn't pass on that information. And by the way, it wasn't just for the children. It wasn't just for the coming generations. You know what Joshua says? And that all the peoples of the earth may know the hand of the Lord. Build these 12 stones to remind you to pass on that spiritual legacy to the next generation and to be a witness to the world. They were there to be a witness to the world. Hasn't God called us to be salt and light, to be a witness to the world and to pass on that spiritual legacy to the coming generations? And what do we read? We read as we go on here in the book of Judges, we read that Joshua dies and the elders that were with him died. And then there arose the next generation the children of Israel who did evil in the sight of the Lord and they followed other gods. People, they lost it in one generation. It only takes one generation to lose a culture. We are on the brink of losing this culture right now. It only takes one generation and we're losing that right now in this culture. We're on the, on, on the precipice of catastrophic change in this nation. Why, why, why was the information not passed on to the children of Israel? You know, if you read Psalm 78, you know how Psalm 78 starts off? Fathers, teach your children so they'll not forget to teach their children. Fathers, teach your children so they'll not forget to teach their children. Then they can teach their children. Fathers, teach your children. And then it goes on and we find out the fathers didn't teach their children. People, we have a major problem in our Western culture. The fathers haven't taught the children. You know what we did? We handed them over to the secular world. You teach them. We'll send them to church and they can tell them about Jesus. And then when our kids come home, what about evolution millions of years? You know what the majority of fathers have told them? Well, I don't know. I don't know about science. I'm not sure. You know what? Just trust in Jesus. I don't know about dinosaurs in millions of years. Maybe God used evolution. Genesis doesn't matter. Trust in Jesus. And what happened was they unlocked a door that said, you don't have to take God's word as written. We didn't have fathers who taught their children how to defend their faith. You know, I praise the Lord that... My father and mother, who, who are, are, are godly people in a pagan culture in Australia, less than 1% who are born-again Christians. My father loved the Word of God when he was dying in hospital about 21 years ago. One of my brothers talked to him and said, why did you love God's Word so, so much? He said, because his father died when he was 16. And so he turned to the words of his heavenly father and just read them over and over again. My father saturated himself in the word of God. And you know, as he was teaching us as children, he didn't just impose the Christian structure on us. He built it from the foundation up. He also would be researching what the liberal critics were saying because he didn't want the liberal critics causing us to doubt the word of God. He actually taught us apologetics. He taught us how to defend the Christian faith. And he taught us from the foundation up. And people, most fathers have not been doing that. And in fact, 
It's true to say, most of our Christian leaders, most of our college professors, seminary professors, Bible college professors, most of our our parents, most of our pastors, not all, but the majority, have compromised God's word when it came to the issues of of creation and, and evolution in this day and age. And we wonder why we're losing the coming generations. You see, as we think about that, I want you to think about this nation generations ago. Remember I said to you at the beginning, when you said the word God in public schools, most kids would think of the God of the Bible. You say the word God now and it's which God? There are many gods. We see that this nation has changed in many ways. In fact, it used to be that there are lots of reminders of the Christian heritage of this nation. In fact, even in our Western world, there used to be lots of reminders of the Christian influence. Even in a pagan country like Australia, that inherited uh, the British system. Bible used to be in the public schools, prayer in the public schools, creation in the public schools, respect for the elderly. Nobody be ever thinking about euthanasia. They're becoming a burden on the culture. How do we get rid of them? There were Christian symbols like crosses, Ten Commandments, nativity scenes in public places. You'd never think of taking Christ out of Christmas. Marriage was considered a man and a woman. Abortion. It's considered killing. Actually, it's murdering a human being. But what's been happening in our culture? We see those reminders of the Christian heritage being removed. And now they're being replaced with a whole different worldview, one of moral relativism that is pervading the culture. And as we look at that, we start to realize what's happened in this culture is it's had a foundational change from building our thinking on God's word to building our thinking on man's word. It's that battle that started in Genesis 3 between God's word and man's word. And people, we live at a time as we stand back and look at the wickedness that we see around us. You know a sign that God is turning a culture over to judgment? You read Romans 1, the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness of men. And it goes through, and those that worship the creature rather than the creator, those that rebel against God as creator. You know a sign that God is turning a culture over to judgment? The sign of homosexual behavior, which is, which is at the forefront of this nation. In fact, our whole Western world, led by the President of the United States, by the way, who has led that change in our world. I believe God is turning this culture over to judgment. I think he's already turned this culture over to judgment. In fact, we stand back and look, look at the abortion issue. 55 million children in America alone murdered in their mother's womb since Roe versus Wade. People, that makes what Hitler did at at the Holocaust pale in comparison. Do you think God is going to just stand back and let that happen? He's turning this culture over to judgment. And we're losing our children. The fathers have not passed on that spiritual legacy. And we stand back and and look at that, and I look at that, and we say, what can we do? What can we do to get the message of God's word of the culture? The church is not impacting the culture like it used to. Much of the church is just watering down the teaching of the word, making the church more entertainment oriented. In many churches, music has become the priority, not the teaching of the word. I'm not against music, by the way, but it's become the priority, not the teaching of the word. We've watered it down and, 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 and we look at what's happening. We're losing generations from the church. We need to do something. Why can't we do something? You know, my father reminded me of a man called Nehemiah. Because when you read about Nehemiah, it says Nehemiah got angry. But it was a righteous anger. It wasn't a sinful anger. The wall's broken down. Why doesn't somebody do something about it? You know, my father was one like that. I remember a devotion book was handed out in church. And it said Noah's flood was just a local event. And everybody else just seemed, oh yeah. My father said, wait a minute, this is not what God's word teaches. We need to do something about this. We, we, we've, got to, we've got to respond to this. We, we can't just undermine God's word like this. It was that Nehemiah anger. And you know, he instilled that in us. It was like when I was at school. But these kids are going to museums. They're all evolutionary. And, and, and they think that evolution means you can't believe in the Bible and, and, and the gospel. And why don't we do something about it? And we started a ministry in our house. And then we built the Creation Museum in 2007. 
And then we said, let's build an ark. In fact, on July 7 this year, as we opened Noah's Ark, the Ark Encounter in Williamstown, Kentucky, let me give you just a little excerpt from the ribbon cutting ceremony. It's really time for Christians to do something of this size, of this quality, to give a message to the world. We're presenting the message of God's word to the world. Quite a number of years ago, there was a man called Joshua. He led the people of Israel across the Jordan River. And then God told them to take 12 stones and to build a memorial as a reminder so that the coming generations would not forget who God is and to also be a reminder to the world. The ark is to be a reminder. We build it as a reminder. It's our 12 stones to remind the coming generations of the truth of God's word. It's our way of presenting the truth of God's word and the gospel to the world. people when you go to the ark those 12 stones are still there and we're going to make them into a permanent exhibit there outside the ark in fact they're working on that right now because really the ark the, the ark is it, it's our 12 stones and we wanted to do something to remind the world of what God has done so they won't forget and that's why I built the creation museum and that's why we built the ark and I'm challenging each one of us why don't we go out of here with that Nehemiah anger ourselves? Think about our own churches. What are our churches doing to train up generations to defend the Christian faith and have answers to, to what God's word says? A lot of our Sunday school material is fluff and stuff. People, it's shallow entertainment stuff. What are we doing about it? What, what, what VBS program are we using? What, what are they teaching our young people? What are we doing in our own homes? What are we doing in our own community? How much are, are we really reaching out to the world to, to reach people with the truth of God's word? What are we doing to build 12 stones as a reminder? Because each one of us can. Imagine if each one of us was like Nehemiah. He, he built the wall. And then he came back and then he saw the injustices. And, and, and what did he do? He threw them out of the tent. Why isn't somebody doing this? What, what's wrong with God's people? They, they need to stand up in this culture and be counted. Oh, but you know what? You stand up today and you stand up for God's word as we do here at the Creation Museum. And you stand up for a young earth and young universe. You'll be scoffed at. You'll be mocked at. You'll be called anti-science. You'll be called anti-academic. And you will because... The, the secularists know if you don't have millions of years, they can't even propose their impossible idea of evolution. They've got to have an incomprehensible amount of time to do that. And so they will absolutely uh, intimidate you. They will bully you. And I look at that and I think, yeah, but Noah was prepared to stand when nobody else except his own family stood with him. If he can do that, I can cope with that scoffing. They haven't sawn me in half yet. They haven't thrown me to the lions like they did for Daniel. They've thrown us into a fiery furnace. We can stand for him. You know, CBS 60 Minutes news program, which is a secular news program in conjunction with Bandy Fair magazine back in 2009, conducted a web survey, and they asked, what archaeological discovery would people want to be made next? 43% said Noah's Ark, nothing else came close to it. And here's what CBS, as a secular organization, said on their website. Noah's Ark continues to capture the imagination of the general public, and this interest spans all social, religious, and economic segments. The Ark and the Flood is one of the few historical events which are well known in the worldwide global circle. And that's true. People have heard of Noah's Ark all over the world. There are flood legends all over the world. In fact, down at the Ark, we have an exhibit on flood legends where we show you some of those flood legends. And of course, when I went to school, I was at university, I was told, oh, the Babylonians have a flood legend like, like the Jews. It's obvious the Jews borrowed their stories from the Babylonians. 
Actually, it's the other way around. <laughs> the real records in the Bible, all of these others handed down through the Tower of Babel, they've changed them. There are elements that are similar to the Bible. But it's the Bible one that when you read it is obviously the real one. It doesn't have gods cutting each other in half and water spewing out and, and a boat that's a cube seven stories high or, or a round circle or, or whatever. You read it and you realize, wow, water from above, water from below. This giant ship with a six to one ratio that would float, that would survive a flood. Wow. And you know, back in... 2008, and then again in 2015, we had America's research group do a general population study in America. This is not the rest of the world. This is just America alone. If we build a life-size ark, if we build it, will they come? And what we found was this. When people answer very likely, 90% of those will come. Somewhat likely, 50%. This is on the basis of the researchers and how they statistically analyze things and from their own experience. And if you add together somewhat likely, 45%, and very likely, 90%, that's 64%. Actually, the original research, it was 63% of the population said they, were, they would want to come and see Noah's Ark. So the research was verified in, two, uh, in 2015, but it, but it got the same sorts of results as 2008. That's 200 million people in America alone said they were interested. And so then they have this formula that they put together and they predicted that a minimum of 1.4 million up to 2.2 million per year would come. Actually, when the Creation Museum opened, they predicted there'd be 400,000 people the first year. There's, there were 404,000 people the first year. And it's averaged about 300,000 a year since then. Now, we also had them ask this. If you're very likely or somewhat likely to come, knowing it was built by a Christian non-profit, are you more or less inclined to go? Because there are people that said, a Christian-themed attraction, that's not going to work. People know it's built by Christians. It's not, they're not going to come. Well, 60% said they're more likely to come. 39% said it didn't matter. 1% said less likely to come. And you know what the research showed? Even non-Christians, and the research indicates 40% of those who will come to the ark will probably be unchurched. But, but even non-Christians, the research showed, when they have children, they want their children to go to family-friendly places. They're concerned about their children. Isn't that interesting? And then one of the questions was asked, if you're somewhat likely or very likely to come, would you consider buying a combo ticket to the Creation Museum? 55% said yes. 41% don't know. So America's research group predicted that the attendance at the Creation Museum would increase by about 400,000 to 700,000 per year. Since the ark opened, if we keep up the same trends, we believe in the year that the ark is opened, comparing Creation Museum, previous attendance, Creation Museum attendance right now is, on, is, is actually on track to, to hit a million people in a year. This includes you, by the way. You think about this, two leading Christian-themed attractions in the world, and thousands of people are coming to them daily. Today, we're predicting about 4,500 people at the Ark, and there'll be about 2,500 people here. That's 7,000 people at both those attractions today. I mean, it's amazing when you think about it, and we believe it's only going to grow. We call it Ark Encounter because we want people to come and have an encounter with Noah's Ark and doing so have an encounter with God's Word and most of all in doing so have an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no point building something if it's just entertainment. And you know what? We've been very bold before the secular world. We've been extremely bold. When they say, what, what are you doing? Building a Noah's Ark? Yes, for what reason? To tell people God's Word is true and to preach the Gospel. And it doesn't matter whether it's... ABC, NBC, CBS, it doesn't matter who it is, we've always been bold about that. That's what we're on about. I remember when the Creation Museum opened, I think it was a CNN reporter, it was up in the main hall and was interviewing me and he said, so what's your motivation? What do you mean? What are you really on about here? What are we really on about? Yeah. I said, oh, stand on the authority of the word of God, proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, see people saved, one to the Lord Jesus, be in heaven with us. And he looked at me and he said, 
He looked at me and he said, so you admit it then? I said, admit what? You're deliberately trying to get people saved? And I looked at him and said, absolutely, that's what it's all about. And you know what he said to me then? Well, that's refreshing. And I said, why did you say that's refreshing? He said, because I interview a lot of people that I know go to church and they're Christians. And when I ask them why they're against abortion and some of these other social issues, because abortion was a big one back then, as it should be today. And he said, they often say, oh, we're on about family values and what's good for the culture. Why don't they just come right out and say, we're Christians and we're on about the Bible? People, we've been intimidated in this culture with this so-called separation of church and state. And we got this idea, oh, if we tell people on about the Bible, they'll look on us as biased. Whereas people who don't talk about the Bible, they're neutral. You know, the Bible says you're either for Christ or against. You either walk in light or you walk in darkness. You either gather or you scatter. There's no neutrality. And we have been bullied by people in the Freedom from Religion Foundation and Americans United for the Separation of Church and State. What do they do? They come in and bully in an area and they're bullying the public schools. That, oh, you're not allowed to go to anything Christian, separation of church and state. Oh, they can go to something that's Muslim or whatever or pagan thing, whatever. But Christian... You, you think about it. You know it's true in, in our culture. If a teacher quoted from the Koran in the classroom, nothing will happen. You quote from the Bible, they'll be threatened to be sued. Because they're intolerant of Christianity. And you know what they do? They bully a, 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 an area. They bully a county or whatever it is to get rid of nativity scenes, Ten Commandments, crosses out of public places. And then they say, see, we got rid of religion. No, they impose their anti-God religion on the culture. Atheism is a religion. It's a non-theistic religion. It's a belief. That's what I told Bill Nye. He's got a religion. He, he, I, when I walked him through the ark recently, you believe everything came about by natural processes. Yes. You can't prove that. Well, no, he can't prove that. It's a belief. It's your religion. Oh, no, I don't have a religion. Oh, yes, he does. We're actually the, we've actually designed an entire park to go with the ark including a wall city, first century village, Tower of Babel, which we'll have to make sure we don't finish. <laughs> Phase one was to build the ark, which we did. And if you've been down there, you know we have a zoo behind it as well, and a petting zoo. And we have a 1,500-seat restaurant. We're going to build a nomad village out the front uh, starting very, very soon. And, and uh, we hope the, the wall city uh, will start on that soon. And it, that'll be open in a couple of years. But we're adding a lot of things in the meantime. We've got a massive exhibit going in on the third deck after the Museum of the Bible exhibit. We have this massive exhibit going in on uh, the doors of Scripture. And how do we know the Bible's true? It's like walking through the pages of a book with these figures, these people, three college students, and one of them's a Christian witnessing to the other two. And as you read it, you want to go to the next page. It's like going to, to chapter after chapter, and they're asking questions, and he's defending his faith, and, and, and one of them becomes a Christian, and, 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 and it's a witness to the world. It's going to be a powerful pr presentation. That should be in, we, we believe, by the end of October. It was very complicated to be able to build the ark the plans are very complicated. In fact, it's really a miracle. Do you know that God brought together thousands, literally thousands of people from all different walks of life, all together at this one time to enable this to happen? Look, 43,000 families donated to the ark. 43,000 families. How do you find an architect to design an ark? You just can't go to a local architect. You design an ark for me. <laughs> we wanted to build as a true timber frame structure using the heavy timbers designed as a ship, built as a building. We heard about an architect in Indiana who had grown up in the Mennonite and Amish communities, been thinking about timber frame structures, had designed America's largest timber frame structure, which is now dwarfed by the ark. And so we went up there to meet him. He wanted to introduce us to the Amish crews that built this timber frame structure. So I went and met with the Amish men that led the crews, that built it. 
And when I gave them the vision for this and helped them understand the whole purpose is evangelistic. It's, it's, it's to go out and tell people. As Noah and his family went through a door to be saved, we need to go through a door. That door is the Lord Jesus Christ who stepped into history and said, I am the door by me if any man in here will be saved. After I presented it to them, one of them hopped up and he said, I believe God has been preparing us all these years just for this. In their hometown, they drive horse and buggies. But they came down for, for nearly two years to be at the ark site during the week and go home on weekends and a hundred Amish craftsmen and then hundreds of other contractors and then all the designers that God brought together, the sculptors, the, the artists that, that God brought together to design the exhibits that, that could earn ten times as much in Hollywood but they wanted to use their talents for the Lord and all the families that supported it. And God brought all these people together in a miraculous way. At this time, people, it, it's a miracle. You're seeing a miracle before your very eyes. Even the creation museum is a miracle. I'll tell you what else is a miracle. That we got the permits. <laughs> that was one of the many permits. Took one and a half years to get. You might think it took one and a half years to fill out, but it took one and a half years to get. There were many other permits. Oh, permits it drives you nuts these days. I mean, it's bad enough in Kentucky. I can't imagine what it's like in California. It must be impossible to build anything out there. I often thought, I wonder how many permits Noah had to get. <laughs> I found, I, I got a copy of his permit. I did. It's been handed down for thousands of years. It's in the Bible. Genesis 6, 14. Make for yourself an ark or go forward. There it is, one permit. <laughs> By the way, I have to say this because if I don't, I'll be asked. People ask us, did you use go for wood? Yes, we had to go for a lot of wood. We used go for wood. <laughs> so the Lord led us to, of course, people from other countries who speak different languages might not understand that. It's got play on words like that. But anyway, so the Lord led us to a property on Interstate 75, 800 acres. And we've now got permits to develop. This is over 200 acres. We moved 1 million cubic yards of dirt for the parking lot, half a million cubic yards of dirt for the ark, built the mile shuttle road here, and this is the rest that's going to be developed. And we're just going to continue on developing that. So it'll just continue to be added to all the time. So you can come back. You can come back, all, you'll see something different almost every week if, if you come back. You may as well move here, uh, actually. <laughs> so we took the dimensions in the Bible, 300 cubits by 50 cubits by 30 cubits, did a lot of research, and we're using an ancient cubit, which we think it's more likely to be one of the ancient cubits back more towards the time of Noah, 20.4 inches. And we had people research ancient ships, some of those ancient wooden ships. There are ancient wooden ships as big as the ark, by the way. And some of those ancient wooden ships had, had like a sail structure on the bow, which we found out from water tank experiments, pointed into the wind so it doesn't go sideways against the waves. And what we're saying is, it's even possible some of that technology was handed down from the time of Noah. And so we used some of that same sort of technology as we built this, and it's a very iconic structure. One and a half times the length of a football field, half the width of a football field. 51 feet high, but we built it 15 feet off the ground. When we moved the half a million yards of, of dirt. We're now within four feet. Actually, we took it down. When you go down to the ark, imagine, go up about 20, 25 feet. That's where the ground used to be. And now go down. Now we're within four feet of limestone. So all of those concrete piers it's built on all go down into solid rock. The entire Christian facility is built on the rock. From ground to roof level is seven stories, from ground to the top of the bow is ten stories. It's the largest timber frame building in the world, 3.3 million board feet of timber. And an average timber frame home, say in Colorado, would be something like 8,000 board feet. This is 3.3 million board feet. And it's a beautiful facility. And this is a 1,500-seat restaurant that we built there. If you've been into the bottom floor of the restaurant, there's a world-class taxidermy display in there as well. And it stands as a reminder to the world. We built a 4,000 space parking lot because we're thinking of the future. 
What we tend to do right now is we use one half and then we swap to the other half and go backwards and forwards. Uh, because it averages out about four people a car, so we could actually have 16,000 people there. And so when the park gets a lot bigger, we'll be able to accommodate those sort of numbers there. We're actually building a theatre right now, a 1,200 seat theatre that'll be open by uh, the uh, spring of next year. And we're going to have live animal programs, a gospel presentation. We, they, they actually uh, turned part of the ark into a movie set yesterday where they were filming this for the gospel presentation. Some of you might have seen uh, the film people there, film crew there. And uh, we're also going to have live presentations like we do here. So we're doing that down the ark as well. And then we're also going to open by spring of next year the restaurant on the roof deck of the ark. It's going to be a reservation restaurant. And you can actually be able to go up there and have a sit-down restaurant, and then you'll be able to walk outside and walk along the outside of the yard. It's just uh, amazing. Um, and it stands as a reminder. It's captured the world's attention. It really has through the media. The zoo at the back, we're going to increase the zoo. Even the reason for the zoo is because we want to show people you can have all sorts of different species within a kind. And Noah didn't need zebras and zorses and zonkeys and donkeys and horses on the ark. He just needed two of the horse kind. He didn't need camels and alpacas and llamas. He just needed two of the camel kind. So there's even a reason why we have the animals we do in the zoo and the petting zoo. And then the exhibits. I remember when we were building the, the Creation Museum, we didn't know how we were going to design it. I mean, I'd written the script of a walk through the seven seas of history. And this is what we wanted to teach, but how are we going to do it? Buddy Davis, I'd met him. And he and his wife Kay had these dinosaurs Buddy had sculptured. We knew we were going to use them, but we're thinking, how are we, how are we going to do this? How are we going to do the museum? And we just designed the biggest building we're allowed to design on this side of the lake, according to the county regulations. And then a man called Patrick Marsh wrote to us. And he, he uh, has worked for Universal Studios, particularly with designs of the Jaws and King Kong attractions. He's worked with the Olympic Games people in Los Angeles. He was in, over in Japan. He's worked in theme parks around the world. And he wrote to us and he said, I'm a Christian. I'm a creationist. I really want to use my talents for the Lord. I want to do something great for the Lord. I heard you're building a creation museum. Please, can I come and design your museum? And we thought about that for a couple of seconds. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? God brought him to us. And then because of him, other sculptors and artists said, if you're doing that, we, we want to use our talents for the Lord. And the media have even said to me a number of times about the museum and the ark, how did you find all these people? I said, well, actually, we didn't find them. Just as Noah didn't have to go and find all the animals, God brought them to him. God brought all these people to us. Exactly the same way. He went out there and God brought them to us. And they are, they are experts in their field. These, these people, they are beyond Hollywood in quality, some of them. In fact, when I had the secular media down at the Ark, remember one from one of the uh, big media giants in America, he said, this is beyond Hollywood. He said, the wood's real. <laughs> and you know, when Patrick came here, you know what he said to us? I said, here's the script. Here's the teaching. Here's what we designed. He said, you don't do it that way. What do you mean? No, 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 no. You don't design the building and then fit your museum in the building. You come up with what you want and then you design a building to fit that. Oh, no, we don't do that. No, we did it the other way around. Sorry about that. The dimensions, it's all there. You've got you to fit the message inside the building. And so he did. And it's a brilliant design that walks through the seven seas that goes down two stories. You don't even realize you're going down. And you realize because of the nature of the way it's designed, you actually use the same space two and three times. I mean, it's incredible. But you know what? God was preparing Patrick for something else. Because when we came to build the ark, we said, guess what? God's already given the dimensions. Sorry about that. <laughs> You're just going to have to fit the message inside. That's what we're going to have to do. And so he designed all the exhibits. Deck one is more Noah's loaded the ark. And deck two are more the themed exhibits. And we have this whole series of exhibits on Noah. Who was Noah? You know what we want people to do? We want to challenge them. Stop having an evolutionary view of history. You know questions people ask me and statements they make? How, how could Noah build the ark? He didn't have the tools we have. Of course he didn't have the tools we have. These are our tools today. Well, how could he build the ark? Well, he had his own tools. 
whatever they were. Yeah, but there's no way he could have built an ark. How do you know that? You weren't there. You know what we've got? We've got this idea, Noah wasn't as good as us. We don't even know how they built those stone structures in South America. Or even the Egyptian pyramids, which is why we have exhibits on that, by the way, in the ark. To challenge people. Who was Noah? You know what we suggest? Just as God, for instance, I look at my own life. God used the home I was brought up in, all my experiences in, in the state of Queensland in Australia, going to lots of different towns, seeing my parents start Sunday schools and bring missionaries in. I mean, all of that. And becoming a teacher. God used all of that for the ministry he prepared us for in, at the Creation Museum and Answers in Genesis and the Ark. And we're challenging people. Don't you think God would have prepared Noah for the Ark? He might have been building ships. I mean, when God said, I want you to build an ark, he didn't say, what on earth is that? I have no idea how to do that. It just seems when you're in the Bible, yep, Noah did what God told him to do. You know what I think it was? Oh, he wanted me to build a ship that big? Okay. I can do that. I think God had already prepared him. He probably had a technology we're jealous of. He lived for hundreds of years. Just imagine if Thomas Edison's and people like that lived for hundreds of years. Can you imagine what they might have accumulated? There are people that say to us, but you used iron in the ark. Yeah, we did. Had to, for code reasons. We did. Well, Noah didn't use iron. Really? Wait a minute. Within seven generations of Adam, their workers are bronze and iron. Who says Noah wouldn't have used iron? They were making musical instruments. We've got this evolutionary view of history. That's why we have that series of exhibits. We even have Noah's library. Library? Writing wasn't invented to the Sumerians. Wait a minute. Genesis 5.1 says this is the book of the generations of Adam. Noah could have taken on writings from the pre-flood world, writings that were handed down to the time of Moses. People were challenging people's thinking. And then deck three has more of the teaching exhibits and the flood and the ice age and the rainbow covenant and, and then the Bible museum, museum of the Bible. So you, you go to the parking lot, you line up to get your tickets, Yes, you have to pay for tickets. But you know what, people? It's a lot cheaper than Disneyland. <laughs> and you know what many people don't really understand? Do you know what the cost is just to maintain a building like this, let alone the ark? Do you know what the cost is to have the staff? Do you know what the cost is to maintain those exhibits? You know, can you imagine the air conditioning bill for the ark alone? That massive structure, we have three 90-ton air conditioning units and 38 other units. Can you imagine the... If you, if you want to come, we're all going to have to help pay for it. And we kept the price as low as we could, but to be realistic. Each one of those buses is a remanufactured bus, half the price of a new one, but they're $300,000 each. Do you know how much they cost to run a day just per one bus? So we've all got to help with that. But I tell you what, if, if, if there's people that have ministries to underprivileged people, others, you know what, we're going to make it work for people to come. But most of us can afford to do it. All we have to do is give up fast food for a day. <laughs> and you get on those buses, and you come over there, and you get in the queue lines and go up that ramp and go through all the exhibits that you see there. And I tell you, the sculptors and the artists, just absolutely amazing what they've done. Even those stoves, they actually work. They still use them in the Middle East. And, and, and when you look at even in the Noah's living quarters, the cupboards that are there, the tables, it's all, they're all real. Noah's, Noah's workbench actually works. The vice actually pulls out. The wheels actually work. I mean, the attention to detail by our artists and sculptors is amazing. And they're going to do the same. Here's Noah. He answers questions, as you know. We have animatronic Noah here and animatronic dinosaurs here. That, that mural of the Rainbow Covenant, an artist in Mexico did that. So loves the Lord, so loves our ministry. He's now moved up here full time, and he's going to be in the gift shop painting every day. Hand-painted items, and he does them for the glory of God. God has brought an incredible number of people together. And then the zoo. I know of no other place in the world where you can get a camel ride with the ark in the background. <laughs> There's no other place in the world. And we have emus and ostriches and zebras and donkeys and yaks, because they're all part of the cattle kind there, and the alpacas and llamas and the kangaroo. Here at the museum, we have wallabies, all part of the kangaroo kind. 
And we'll get more and more signs up for the teaching aspect of these things as time goes on, as we've done here at the Creation Museum. And you know, really, as we look at the ark, I want you to think about this. The greatest symbol as a reminder of the message of salvation is the cross. But other than the cross, I really believe the greatest reminder of the message of salvation is the ark of Noah. The Lord said to Noah, come into the ark, all you and all your household, because I've seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Noah built the ark, and God brought the animal kinds, two of each, seven of some, to come on board the ark. And then Noah's family. The Bible says Noah was a preacher of righteousness. You know the sad thing? We don't know how long he preached for. I, I think he could have preached for many years. Building the ark is preaching. I think it could have taken him quite a number of years to build the ark. It wasn't 120 years, by the way. 120 years in the Bible is from then for 120 years. That's how much time they've got till the flood comes. Because think about it. Noah, Noah was spoken to by God when he had sons who had wives. And Shem got off the ark when he was 99 years old. Got on the ark when he was 98 years old. So they were already married. Maybe he took 30 years, 20 years, 40 years. You know what 1 Peter 3 says? God was long-suffering in the days of Noah. Noah building this ark, I think it did take years because I think God was long-suffering. So that people had no excuse. And then Noah went inside the ark. And then the Bible says, God shut the door. Did that wake you up? What happened? Then the flood came. It left its mark all across the earth. The fossil record, most of that's the graveyard of the flood. It's not the result of millions of years. God's son stepped into history 2,000 years ago to be Jesus Christ, the God-man, the babe in a manger. He said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he'll be saved. And you know, that door is open. And while that door is still open, Shouldn't we be doing whatever we can to remind the world of that door and to get them to the door of the ark? We can't push them through. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But we can get them to the ark's door. You know what's happening in the world? The devil is doing all he can to take your children away from the ark door. And in many ways, we've helped and let him do it. People, what are we doing to get our children, our neighbors, our friends to the ark store? And you know, uh, within another couple of days, you're going to have a big sign beside that, those big doors there and there. That's one of the favorite places for people to get a photo. We're going to have it all lit up and we've got a sign on there that'll talk about the door of the ark. One door. God told Noah to put one door on the side of the ark. We believe it was on the second deck because it talks about the lower deck. So it makes sense. The door was probably on the settled, second deck in the middle of the ark. One door. They had to go through one door to be saved. Then God shut the door. There's one way for us to be saved. There's one door, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, as you think about that, it's important to recognize that we are living in the last days. Now, it's been the last days ever since God's son stepped into history to be the God-man. So we're living in the last days. But we also got to remember this. We don't know how last we are. We just know we're more last than we were. Wherever that is. It could be another thousand years before Christ returns. See, in 2 Peter 3 it says, look, in the last days there's going to be scoffers. And they're going to reject creation. And they're going to reject the flood. Wow, just like today. They reject creation. They reject the flood. These scoffers in the last days. You know what was interesting? The day that we opened the ark to the public to help make it more authentic, God allowed scoffers to come. These atheists that came and demonstrated against us opening an ark. We don't want you. There's a massive number of them compared to the number that were there on ribbon cutting day <laughs> at the ark. You know what's interesting? I actually agreed with one of the scoffers. 
Yeah. He was holding up a banner with a bathtub bath with giraffe sticking out the chimney saying, this fable won't float exactly. <laughs> That's why we have an exhibit on the second deck called the fairy tale Ark Exhibit where we show most of the Christian children's books in the world have Noah's Ark as a overloaded bathtub with giraffe sticking out the chimney about to sink at any moment. And you know one of the most used accusations in the world against the ark, Noah couldn't have fit all the animals on board. And you know when children step off the buses there at the ark and I interview them and I say, what do you think? Before they even go in, many of them use their hands and they go, it's huge. They're obviously watching the political race on TV. <laughs> it's huge. It's big. That very fact, when they see and experience the size of the ark, immediately tells them this was real. To overcome those bathtub arcs that are on our kindergarten walls in our churches. People, be like Nehemiah. Go back and say, we need to do something about this. But Mrs. Brown painted those. <laughs> she was wrong. We're going to show them what the real ark looked like. It didn't look like. I know it's cute and I know she did her best. But you know what? We need to now say, let's show them what the real ark looked like. People, we need to do that. We need to be Nehemiahs like that in regard to our Sunday school literature and our kindergartens and, and preschools and our churches. Oh, yeah, we had real life scoffers. But on ribbon cutting day, two days before... The, the atheists, there were seven to 8,000 people there. And you know what? In Peter it says, Beloved, don't forget this one thing. To God a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day. Which has nothing to do with the days of creation. It's saying God's outside of time. To God a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like a day. People, you know something? Second, second Peter here we're reading. So why, why has God not come back? It's been 2,000 years. Why has he not come back? Oh, because he's long-suffering, as he was in the days of Noah. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Wow. Shouldn't that be our burden too? That all should come to repentance. And so what manner of people ought you to be? We're challenged with. Beware lest you also fall. Beware lest the devil takes you away from the door of the ark. Beware lest he's taking your kids away from the door of the ark. The kids in your churches, your neighborhood, what are you doing to get them to the door of the ark? You know, God's word says, always be ready to give a defense, to give an answer. Teach apologetics. Contend for the faith. It doesn't just say, oh, go to church on the weekend, sit there, sing a song or two, go home. Contend for the faith. And that means, hey, why do you have these bathtub arcs on the kindergarten wall? We're contending for the faith. Preach the gospel. Make disciples. And one of my favorite passages, the parable of the ten minas. He gave resources to people and then he said, do business till I come. People, don't just look at the culture and get depressed about what you see going on. If Noah did that, he wouldn't have built the ark the culture and say you know what it doesn't matter how bad you know what I need to be on about the business of the king what's the business of the king making disciples answers what we believe intending a higher anger And what I want to do is to challenge us with video clip with me talking to Bill Nye. I want you to see what happened at the ark when I challenged Bill Nye with the gospel message. And before I do that, let me just mention to you, I'm going to be out here for a little while. Afterwards, you want to come and say hi. I encourage you to go to Answers and Genesis website. Hey, get equipped with resources. These are our pocket guides. They're normally $6 each. You can have them for $2 each. 
that answer a lot of questions. If you fill out that form to get on our mailing list, email newsletter list, keep up to date with what we're doing, we'll give you a DVD of my testimony. Use our witnessing book, Begin. You know, you know how God presents the gospel? It starts at Genesis. Start at the beginning. Lay the foundation. And so this witnessing book has Genesis 1 to 11, the foundation, Exodus 20, the law, the book of John, the life of Christ, the book of Romans, the gospel in detail, last two chapters of Revelation, new heavens, new earth, a summary of the Bible in the middle, and then 10 of the most asked questions with short answers, and what does it mean to be saved? And, and, and we encourage you to get copies of that and give it away. We have a You Choose program, put together combinations of our books at different prices and get discounts for them. My book, The Lie, The Importance of the Book of Genesis. Most of our churches and church leaders have compromised Genesis. We're losing the coming generations. This challenges God's people to get back to the Word of God. That's the message of this ministry. Already gone, ready to return, the two most definitive works on research on why we're losing generations from the church. What's wrong with our, many of our Sunday school materials and so it goes on the answers books the biggest selling creation apologetics books in the world 120 of the most asked questions with detailed answers young people adults you get those answers you'll be able to answer most of the questions that you'll hear out there detailed books on one race one blood the six days and the age of the earth for little kids because doubt started at a young age a is for adam d is for dinosaur n is for Noah. we've had lots of kids one of the lord through those books how many animals are on the ark? A brand new book. That's one of the most leveled accusations against the ark. And we produce this as like a middle school sort of age, which means parents will understand it. <laughs> right? I have parents tell me I prefer the kids' books. I understand them. Very important books. Dragons and Dinosaurs. My son, El Bodhi, uh, put a lot of that together. And he wrote this book on the Tower of Babel. And and showing how all the cultures of the world, we can trace names back to Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Books on dinosaurs, showing you how to explain them from a biblical perspective. Books of history, showing how from Adam and Eve and all the way through to the present, we can put all those cultures together, even a more detailed one. Books on world religions and cults. We've got a third volume coming out in the fall, and atheism is one of the religions discussed in that. You can get um, a whole kit on with the Bill Nye debate on DVD, a book about everything he said and now answers to everything and how to confound the critics. Uh, six of my main talks, the hour talks, done up as 12, 30 minute programs and a curriculum that goes with them. And this is like a, an introductory foundations apologetics curriculum. And then uh, the Answers Bible Curriculum, a three-year Bible curriculum. Now thousands, literally thousands of churches are now using this. They say it's revolutionizing their churches. It is so meaty. We teach biblical authority. It's chronological through scripture. We connect Old and New Testament. We teach apologetics. We do the same sort of emphasis in our vacation Bible school curriculum. And they're saying that this is revolutionizing our churches. It goes from kindergarten, preschool, all the way through adult. And you can have a look at it out here. And then one last thing, our award-winning Answers magazine. It's a Christian worldview magazine. It's one of the biggest Christian magazines in the world. And it's won many of awards. Has a mini magazine for kids in the middle. And uh, the, this current issue has a lot to do with Noah and the flood as well because we opened the ark. And if you get $75 more uh, or more of resources, we'll actually give you a subscription free. And so what I wanted to do, I wanted to finish with this and, and then finish in prayer. And uh, I wanted you to see what can happen when we build an ark as a reminder. Because I invited Bill Nye to come through the ark, and he did. He brought a, TV, t a television crew with him, or a video crew with him, and we said, well, we want our video crew with us, so he let us do that. And so we walked through the ark together, and he was scoffing and mocking, and uh, we're going to put up the whole two hours on the internet at some stage in the future. Uh, but at one stage, I was able to talk to him about the gospel, particularly when it came to the first blood sacrifice and the fact that God gave clothes because of sin. But right now, you're just giving me opinions as to why we wear clothes or no. You're talking about weather. You, you, you don't have a basis for it. I don't have a basis for why people wear clothes? No, you don't have a moral basis for it. A moral basis. Here's another thing we disagree about, everybody. People in the scientific community claim that what we feel is a result of evolution. So that we have sympathy for each other, that we get angry with each other, that we work very hard to raise our children, provide them with resources, is deep within us. It's part of who we are. It is not a result of a top-down uh, issuance of laws. That's the claim in science. And we observe this in other species. 
okay, I'll let you say that. You know what, uh, young people and everyone here, God gave clothes because of sin. The fact that we're wearing clothes is a reminder that God killed animals and clothed Adam and Eve, the first blood sacrifice that are covering for their sin, pointing towards the fact that someday one would come to die for our sin, die for your sin, Bill, and die for mine, be raised from the dead and offer a free gift of salvation. And he offers it to you too. Um, thank you. And, and you I'm very skeptical that sin caused us to wear clothes. It may be very skeptical. That's okay, but it is a reminder to you that God provides salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God is raised from, from the dead, you'll be saved. And you'll be like so many of these people here. So my understanding, you, you were not born again, were you? You just started with this. Not born again. Were you born again? Jimmy Carter was here recently, right? Absolutely I'm born again. You were born again, okay. Absolutely. If you're not born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. We're born of a woman, and then we're born again by the Spirit of God for those who receive that free gift of salvation. You can be born again too. You know, you know what the Bible says? If you're not born again, you suffer a second death, which is eternal separation from God. And I'm not going to suffer that second death. Now, I don't want you to suffer that second death. I really don't, Bill. I know you don't. I would prefer that you weren't indoctrinating young people with anti-science. So anyway, at the end, as we finished our two hour walk through the ark, and you should watch the rest of the video, it, it's quite interesting. You see that clash of worldviews, but here's what happened at the end. They had a lot of space. So we have uh, Noah. Noah's praying with his family before the flood. Would you let me pray before we part? Uh, go ahead, yeah. That's okay? Yeah. I mean, if it does that makes you feel better. Would you let me pray for you? Uh, I can't stop you, Mr. Ham. Okay. okay. While so, you're doing that, I'm going to be wishing like crazy that you all go to universities and learn about the worldview that, that, associated that's okay. with science. I just, want to, I just want to say a short prayer. A gracious, love of Heavenly Father, we come before you as a creator of the universe, and we're going to thank you and praise you for who you are, what you've done in creating us. We know that we, in Adam, sinned against you, and that we're fallen creatures, and we know that death is a consequence, but you stepped into history in the person of your son to save us so that we can spend eternity with you. I pray for Bill, pray you'd open his heart to the truth of your word and that he would not suffer that second death. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Here's hoping you all learn about the process of science, the best idea humans have ever had. And I hope you learn about the cosmos and our place within it. Well, you know what? Uh, I don't know what's happening in Bill's heart. But in fact, he debated me on stage here, and probably upwards of 20 million people now have seen that debate around the world. In fact, he came to the ark, we had a two hour walk through. He has heard the gospel. He's heard it very clearly. And I pray God will continue working on his heart. And I pray that all of us can go out there and be a witness to others, because it's not his will that any should perish. Let's pray. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you Lord, that your word is truth. Forgive us for the times when we have doubted your word. Lord, help us to, to pass on that spiritual legacy to the coming generations. And Lord, help us to be like Nehemiah, to have that spirit of Nehemiah, that we go back to our own churches, homes, neighborhoods, and we can say, why doesn't somebody do something about this? And we can be the person like Nehemiah to help build that wall, to influence people, to impact people for the Lord Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Ken. That was great. Um, thank you also for joining us. Um, 